Assalamu alaikum to another episode of Shared Diversity where we talk about the power of diversity in your business, brand, and womanhood. If you are new, salam, my name is Sina. Thank you so much for tuning in. And if you have been here before, thank you so much for coming back. Today I talk with Leslie Maxi, Olympian turned broadcaster and businesswoman, and we talked about the power of voice and how to find your own, her journey from Olympian into broadcasting and business, and gendered ageism, and the power of age diversity, how parents can take advantage of that, and so much more, her gray hair journey. It was incredible. Make sure that you leave down in the comments any section that particularly stood out, and don't forget to like and subscribe. Let's get into it. Assalamu alaikum, and welcome to another episode of Shared Diversity. Today we are live with Leslie Maxi, and I'm going to call her in. Hi, Leslie. <laughs> Hi, Sina. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm excellent. Amazing. So glad to have you here, and you look amazing. <laughs> Just... Thank you. I thought I'd give you a red lip, and then I was like, oh, give her all red lips. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Thank you so much for uh, doing this, and I'm... Um, I'm really excited to talk to you. We we talked before. Uh, we actually met at Adidas when you were there with Edwin. And you have such a beautiful energy on you. And you just, like, all the spark just came over. <laughs> and I'm excited that we kept in contact. And for everyone who's new here, uh, welcome. I also see Edwin in the comments. Hello. 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 <laughs> it's amazing that he's on. So, as always, what we're going to do is we're going to get into our conversation and then we have time later on for Q&A. And I'm excited to start. So how we always start this uh, podcast is we give you a space to introduce yourself in 30 seconds. Okay. Well, my name is Leslie Maxey. I am a wife and a mother. I'm a 1988 U.S. Olympian in the 400 hurdles. I am a former junior world record holder. I am the founder and president of Maxi Media Group. We train athletes, executives, and activists who are front-facing to the camera or speak from the stage. And I'm an international keynote speaker myself. Uh, 30-year broadcast pro, so got a lot to talk about. <laughs> Amazing. I think you just um, created the perfect elevator pitch for yourself that everyone else can like take notes and be like, this is how you introduce yourself. <laughs> Of course, not everyone has this amazing journey as you have, but um, I really wanted to get to know a little bit more about your work because you do so much and over your uh, journey, you know, 30 years in television, uh, 30 years record uh, holder. So I just wanted to talk a little bit more about something that actually brought us together, which was diversity work and diversity, equity and inclusion work. And because this is the Shared Diversity Podcast and we believe that, you know, everyone, like the one thing that brings us all together is our innate diversity and what makes us different. I wanted to talk to you and ask you, what does diversity mean to you personally? Wow. Well, thank you. That's a great question, Sina. Diversity for me is about seeing ourselves in many different iterations. Um, when my daughter was four, you know, five years old, um, we got a magazine from our Chamber of Commerce talking about the area, and it was a very diverse area. And she's flipping through the magazine, and she said, Mommy, there's no one in here that looks like me. And I said, certainly you're wrong. <laughs> I go through the magazine, and sure enough, no black, no brown, <laughs> no nothing. <laughs> and, and I said, you know, that's, that's a problem, and I appreciate you pointing that out five-year-old. So I called our city manager and I told him the same thing. And he said, certainly that's not the case. And he flipped through the magazine and he, he, he said, I am aghast. I'm so embarrassed. He said, you know, we are a very diverse community and we should all be represented. Thank your daughter for what she did. And I promise you, I promise her we'll do better next time. And the next city magazine that came out when I tell you every walk of life was, was represented in that magazine, I didn't even know there was that much diversity in the world, let alone our community. But I say that to say this, it, diversity is important. It's important that we see ourselves in many different lenses. I, the, if I had a dime for every time I was the only or the other in a room, I wouldn't have to work. And, and I got started in my adult um, life of television because I saw Pam Oliver working the sidelines. And I said, I can do that. But I saw somebody that looked like me 
And prior to that, I think it was like Jane Kennedy when I was a very, very young girl. So it's important that we see ourselves in, in images and in media and, and so that we can connect and we feel connected to the brand. It helps the brand. It helps me feel like you see me and I'm more apt to purchase your brand. Yeah, that's a, you covered so many things here. I think one of the things that you covered is, um, and this is something that I actually heard from uh, Shonda Rhimes, the FOD, first only different, right? And then the importance mm -hmm. of you cannot be what you cannot see. So representation and that young five-year-old girl not seeing herself anywhere represented. So what has that, you, you talked a little bit about your uh, career in television and in, in, in sports, but just before you got into your athletic journey, who did you see that you thought, or when was the moment Do you remember the moment where you were like, I, I think I can do this. I, I see someone or I might not see someone and I want to be that someone. When was that moment for you? Absolutely. Well, I come from an athletic family. Um, my cousin, Brooke Gaston, um, was the one of the first generation of Title IX recipients of a scholarship to went to Cal Berkeley. Um, my cousin, Marion Boughton, uh, went to Cal Berkeley as well and was an alternate for the 1980 Olympic team that we boycotted. So I'd seen that all my life. And my brothers ran and I was a tomboy and whatever they did, I did. So it was kind of in the genes. But The moment when I knew that this was something that I could do moving forward um, was when I was 10 years old. I was on a relay team and we won a national title. And I, I came off the track and my cousin Marion, who had just come back from a junior national team, and she had these beautiful USA sweats on. And, you know, and I, I came across the finish line and my family greeted me and, you know, high fives and handshakes and all of that. And later on, I was laying on the grass recovering. And Marion walked over and she took off her jacket and she kind of tossed it on me and she said, One day you'll earn your own. Cena, when I tell you that day, I decided, oh, I'm going to be an Olympian. <laughs> Now, I didn't know that a junior national team wasn't the same as the Olympic team, but it was where seeing the USA, the red, white, and blue, and, and just having so much pride in what she was doing and having just had a big performance myself, I was able to see myself as this person. And it became like my North Star. Now, in hindsight, I should have said, I'm going to go to the Olympics and win a gold medal. Well, <laughs> level of specificity is important. But yeah, that was when I decided that that track was the thing for me. It's beautiful. It's also beautiful that you had that very close to you and in your family. A lot of times we see, you know, we see people succeeding. And in hindsight, they're like, yeah, but I only could do this because I saw that I, you know, I saw that there was a possibility for me to be there. Um, but then, of course, you know, seeing and acting upon it and then achieving are like very different things. So can you walk us a bit more um, through your athletic journey and what brought you really to that finding your identity in the space? Uh, for me, you know, on a very, very small level as a tennis player, I think my athletic journey really brought me to that confidence that people say I have now and that I can feel is a privilege that I have. We talked about I said, you know, like there's a privilege of confidence that I learned because of my journey as an athlete and others might not have that or might not have that journey. So, so can you tell us a bit more about how you found your identity and your space within that athletic journey? You know, I'm, I'm very blessed to have women around me and my parents that they valued my voice. They encouraged me to use it. And so I say that to say this, I, I always knew the track was something that I did. It wasn't who I was. Who I am is a person who loves people. I love connection. You know, I, I, we exist in relationships. And so I am very much that person. And even through my track, that was something that always came through the relationships, relationships that I still have to this day, people that I've known since I was six years old and I started running, or we were on our first junior team at 14 or 15 years old, you know, or on our, my first international trip to Japan with some women that I'm still friends with today. So the relationship part of it was always very important to me. And, and that has followed me all of my life through my broadcasting, through the work that I do with speakers, speaking myself on stage. It is just, it's a part of who I am. And so the confidence that comes from it is this, 
going through the process of becoming an Olympian is it's not about the 10 hurdles that you can master. It's about the work that you put in to get to that space, to get to that one place, and to be able to hearken on that work to use it in other areas of my life, becoming a, a reporter in a number one news market, working for ESPN and Fox Sports and CBS. Those things are not coincidental. Yes, they're an extension of who I am, but it's the work. It's the work. I would, I would venture to say, you know, people love and love Michael Jordan. Mm -hmm. Michael Jordan was probably not the best basketball player to ever hit the paint, but he had a work ethic that was second to none. And that's what made him a star. But that's where the hope is because each one of us have something inside of us, something inside of us. That's that special thing that, that God has kissed you with. And if you can identify it, the awareness first, and then press into the process of developing that thing, then you can have that same Olympic experience in whatever your area of expertise is. That's, that's the thing that's special about being an Olympian. Yeah, wow, that, that's a big part. I think that everyone has kind of like their, their special superpower that they bring into whatever they are doing. And I, I love that you bring uh, Michael Jordan's example because there was a documentary not on Netflix that my husband and I were, uh, you know, incredibly like, like we were <laughs> the in there for year. a week just talking about it. <laughs> and the work ethic was one of the things that not only does that work ethic reflect on your own achievements, but it really, it kind of becomes the ripple effect that inspires your entire environment to step up and I think that environment you know you find that as an Olympian just being there in the space with the biggest athletes in the world but you can also find that in your professional environment or in your friend circle like being very very aware of who you gather around and whether those people pull you up or you pull those people up or whether there's like mediocrity you know in in that in that space. And I think that so you can say it dragging you down. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And I think you cannot change until you change your environment and how you surround yourself and who you surround yourself with. And that can also be energy, right? The energy of that people bring into your space. Some people are not the highest achievers, but they will bring energy to you that will pull you up. And that is their blessing, right? That's their superpower to like bring that positivity into the space. Um, so I love that you bring that up. I wanted to go in, into more of um, how your athletic, and, and you, you, you talked a bit about that, but from your athletic journey, you then are an Olympian and then you go out and you have to find yourself and define yourself all over again. So how was that process of just like finding out what else does define you and, and brings you joy and where are you good at? Mini break, please don't forget to subscribe. Hit the subscribe button to get the newest and freshest content. Yeah. Well, you know, back to that 10, 10 year old was a really big year for me. Okay. So that same year, um, we were participating in a track meet at the Cal Palace in San Francisco, it was this big indoor track meet. And uh, there was this athlete that I loved. His name was Houston McTeer. And he, every year, we, you know, he'd come, he just, just clean up, medals, awards, the whole nine yards. And all of us kids would gather around him and get the same autograph that we had gotten the year before, whatever. <laughs> but we loved Houston McTeer. The very last year I saw him, he did not do well, he didn't get a good start, kind of got it, kind of got waxed. <laughs> and afterwards we, you know, went to find him so we could get our autograph. And he said, Nah, kid, I don't want to. And he kind of, you know, kind of sloughed us off. Now, we probably should have left him alone and given him some time to just, you know, kind of absorb what happened. But I remember saying, if I'm ever in a place where I'm not enjoying what I'm doing, I'm not going to do it anymore. If I'm not enjoying running, I'm not going to do it anymore. It doesn't matter where I am. And so fast forward to post-1988. And I was, you know, I was struggling. I came back to school. Um, I was, you know, you have this entire international experience and then all of a sudden you're, you're back in college doing your homework. <laughs> um, I had something happen to me that I didn't know how it impacted me until recently. 
And, um, and it really did, uh, I thought I was burned out, but this incident really did impact me in a way that it, it changed my relationship with track and field. And so I went another couple of years running. Um, I, I left my childhood coach, Mr. Parker, God rest his soul. And I went to Maryland to train with his first Olympian, a woman named Pat, um, Pat Connolly, but she was Pat uh, Winslow at the time. Uh, but Pat Connolly, I went to train with her. Um, she trained Evelyn Ashford, the great American sprinter. Ah, woman's incredible, whole other conversation. Um, but so I went to train with Pat because I said, I needed a change. And I wanted to get into the best shape of my life. So if I walked away from track and field, I would be walking away on my own terms and not walking away because I was tired or injured or whatever. And I had dealt with a lot of injuries post Olympic games. So um, I went to train with her. And when I tell you I was ripped, Cena, I was ripped. <laughs> and I, I just, I came to the realization, even though I was in great shape, I was not enjoying myself anymore. And it was time because I knew, and like I said in the beginning of the interview, track was something that I did. It wasn't who I am. And so to be able to walk away on my terms was very, very important. It was critical, dare I say. And, um, and I, I was able to start to look and see what other things have I done or what I like to do that I'd like to develop and cultivate to that same extent that I did track and field. Um, I have been, I'm a natural born marketer. And so I knew that was gonna be something that was gonna be part of my journey. Um, Pat's uh, husband who is now deceased, um, Harold Connolly was um, a big mucky muck at the International Special Olympics. And, uh, and so I went to work for Maryland Special Olympics. I ran the Western portion of the state. And, and a lot of what I did was marketing and, and all of that. And it was just, it was so much fun. It was still athletics, but it was athletics with a spin. You had these athletes who were devoted and dedicated and loved their sport. And it was about their personal achievement, not necessarily about winning or you know, any of that. And yes, they were competitive and, and were out there to win. But there was this esprit de corps that took place, you know, the support that they had for one another. And it was just a beautiful thing to see. And so it was such a nice next step for me because it allowed me to still have my hands in competition. It allowed me to um, flex my marketing muscles and learn about just business processes and, and to really spread my wings in a different way. And so um, one of the one day I went actually to the Baltimore Orioles to pitch them on an event that I wanted their players to be involved with. And, uh, and I spoke with Calvin Hill. Now, Calvin Hill um, is the Hall of Fame running back from the Dallas Cowboys, the Browns. I mean, this man was like everything. And he also is a graduate, I believe, of Yale. So, you know, very um, heady guy and just, you know, such a distinguished man. Uh, so I gave him my pitch and I'm like, okay, what do you think? And so he's like, well, we already have the charities that we work for, but do you want a job? <laughs> and... I, you know, they offered me a job in the marketing department and it was yet another opportunity to flex my muscles and to grow and to, to learn a new approach to marketing. And so I took the job and it was just a, a beautiful experience. So I worked in, in marketing for most of my young professional life. And then um, after I got married and had my kids, I came back to television when my kids were two and four years old. Okay. I love the story around, first of all, like you do something and then you are something, right? Those two things can be like, can come together and be merged, but it doesn't have to. So like defining yourself for what you do or through what you do can be useful to understand who you are, but it is not who you are. And I think that is one of the questions that a lot of clients ask me as well. Like, how can I build a brand if I do so many things and it may confuse people, but there's a difference between doing something and being something or, you know, like understanding your character and personality. And one of the things that you said was uh, you found yourself in the space of sports and performing, but in a new version of yourself which is the person that is outspoken that understands how to you know market something uh that looks at it like it's kind of like a bubble the universe of sport and you look at it from a different lens 
looking inside, but you were inside it. So, you know, already a lot. Um, I love that. And it, it resonates a lot with me because when I moved abroad and I just like, I was never too proud to take any job. I just to understand like what I'm good at. One of the things that I really loved was not only um, hosting, for instance, tennis camps, but also marketing them. And I was ve way better at marketing them than operating them, which is really interesting. <laughs> I was like, I love this, but I love this part of it, not this. <laughs> and that self-awareness, I think, so crucial um, that you just brought up. And I wanted to talk a bit more about what you said in terms of marketing and then using that for speaking on television and then eventually going back and seeing there are other athletes, professional athletes that are coming out and want to do the same. How can I support them? So can you walk us a bit more through that journey of then turning it into a business and supporting those who you, you like you, who you were five, 10 years ago? Absolutely. So for me, you know, understanding the aspect of marketing and, and understanding that you have to have a brand that you believe in. There is not a brand that I believe in more than this kid. <laughs> so to be able to, to transition to television and, and sit down with an executive and, and be able to articulate who I am, what's important to me when I am connecting with someone for a story, the work that I'll put in to source and make sure that everything is done properly and in order, and, and that I am a team player and I'll collaborate with my producers and editors, sound guys, everything that I need to be able to do to have an excellent outcome product for television, I was able to, to message those things and get the jobs that, um, that I felt were, were comparable to my skill. You know, there was one time I was sitting with an executive and it was, it was for my first national show. And I, I went through all the reasons why I was the one and he's like shaking his head. So finally he said, look, I can look at the things that you've done and know that you're actually not ready for the opportunities that you're asking for. He said, but I also look at the things that you've accomplished. And I can look at that and say, if I plant a seed, something may come back. I said, sir, if you plant a seed, I will give you a redwood. That was before my first national show. And my first national interview was with uh, Alex Rodriguez. So it, he, it was important to me that I take this, this hope that he, um, this opportunity that he provided to me and not just do a little something with it, but really blow it up so that I could do both well by myself, but well by this person who believed in me, who put his reputation on the line. This man's name is Steve Tello, and he just was wonderful to me when I was at Fox Sports Net. Um, so as a reporter, it was important to me when I was sitting with someone, irrespective of the interview, if it was an interview, sometimes you sit down with someone and it's going to be a controversial conversation. Sometimes you sit down and it's, you know, very much a highlight fluff piece. So it, you know, it really depends. But I wanted to make sure that I was always the same person. I did not answer to Fox Sports. I didn't answer to ESPN. I answered to God. And so I never wanted to be the person who put myself or put someone in a position where they felt painted into a corner. I will ask an open question and I'll ask it in such a way that you'll be able to have a lot of landscape to give me the answer. I give you the rope. Are you a cowboy or do you hang yourself with it? That's not on me. I'm going to ask you an open question. And so a lot of times when I would sit down, especially if it was with a young athlete, and if it was with a young athlete who didn't have a lot of experience on camera, I'd engage them in conversation to get a sense of how they answered questions. And then if I could see, okay, they don't really know that you answered in a complete sentence so that you can take out my, my question and actually just use their answer. So I'd explain to them, hey, a package is put together like this. So when you answer my question, answer in a complete sentence so they can take my question out and just focus on you. I'll do a stand-up, I'll get my time on camera, but this is about you. And so in doing that, I found that I was actually doing a lot of coaching. <laughs> and so um, when I was on a, a show for ESPN, it was a studio show hosting and anchoring and, and reporting. And one of the um, athletes that was on the show as well, he came on and he was doing a um, segment that was a movie review, which is kind of a fluff piece. But he, he um, pulled me aside one day and he said, Leslie, I want to learn to do what you're doing. I want to learn how to host 
how to anchor, how to field report. I want to go, but I'm a Super Bowl champion. And so I can't go to Huntsville, Alabama and get my reps in. I have to enter the space as a Super Bowl champion. <laughs> so I was like, okay, so you need for me to go through my experience and basically extrapolate the lessons. So that was the first time that I actually overtly coached someone. They asked for the service, I provided the curriculum. <laughs> and it was, a, it was a great experience. The gentleman is working in New York City right now. He is a STAR star. <laughs> and I, you know, I feel like I have something to do with that. <laughs> so, you know, so that was kind of the beginning of my journey. And then when I turned um, 50, I, I made a decision, you know, my company, Maxi Media Group, our tagline is your media needs under one umbrella, because I've done a lot of things in the media space. I've done international communications for Red Bull Racing, Formula One. I've done regional communications and PR for NASCAR. I've worked for the Orioles, as we talked about, Special Olympics, obviously the, um, the time I've spent on field and then the broadcasting work. And so all of these things, I said, I wanted to give myself and my um, colleagues in my company, the opportunity to do multifaceted work in the, in the media space. But when I turned 50, I said, what is the thing that I would do, no matter if they were paying me or not? And remember, 10 years old, gotta love what you do, okay? <laughs> so the thing that I love to do is help people find their voice and particularly women, to help women find their voice. When women rise, we rarely rise alone. And so if we have the ability to speak our truth, to articulate our thoughts in a way that people can connect with them and take them and, and have it be actionable, girl, I do that for free all day and every day on Sunday, okay? <laughs> So that was something that I, I just love to do. And I love to speak from the stage. And I, I still love television. That same vice president that gave me that opportunity, my first national opportunity, he said, Leslie, your gift is in connecting. People trust you. They trust you quick. And you are a person of integrity. So that trust is not misplaced. That is your gift. So whatever you do for the things that you want to create, make sure that you are always the vehicle that's connecting with the audience, be it on stage, be it on television. He said, I want to make sure that you're always that person that's connecting. And I've always kept that in my mind. It's beautiful. Oh, wow. There's so much. So I think one of the things that I got from what you said is, again, that understanding of how do I express myself to the fullest and in the way that whatever is most authentic to me can give the best value to others and then and then there's this thought of i mean i'm just going to quote you all day long but i don't answer to anyone but god i think this is one of the things that i think when you when you drive your career and your life in that way then there's rarely a moment where you think you're not true to yourself because you're true to that higher power that is guiding you. Um, and God has created you. God has created you for a reason with the strengths that you have for a reason, with the values and the visions that you have for life for a reason. In the moment, you are for a reason with all the people that tell you, like, you're, you know, you are that vehicle, be that connector wherever you go. Um, and I think that intentionality is so crucial. Um, do you have let's say top three tips for women who want to find their voice and want to express it in the way that is authentic to them. I know that's a, you know, a lot of things pulled down, but maybe just something that someone just can write down and like start today. You know, the name of our curriculum is the speaker in you. And it's because I truly believe that everything you need to be a capable, confident, speaker already resides inside of you. And so what I'm trying to do is, is help you get at that so that you can stand in your truth. So I'd say the first thing that I would um, advise a woman to do is take some time to be introspective. Meditative writing, <laughs> and I, I say that very deliberately, meditation is, I think, such an important vehicle for our lives. 
and writing is an important vehicle for our lives. The meditation aspect of it allows you to get in touch with both yourself and your higher self, however you define that. And then the, the writing aspect of it, because I'm 54 years old, so I'll think of something and it will go out my head. Same though, same. <laughs> <laughs> so if I'm meditating and writing, there's like a stream of consciousness that, that comes forth, forth. It's almost like a, like a, a, a fountain that comes forth and, and allow yourself to be with what comes out. So if you start with a prompt to say, you know, what are the things that I truly feel passionate about? Not the things that I was told I feel passionate about, not the things that the world says, Hey, you're good at this. <laughs> and you think I gotta be this, you know, the things that you truly feel passionate about and get in touch with that and then see what bubbles up from there. Okay, so meditation, writing, I think are very, very important. And then prayer, the prayer life, I mean, irrespective of, of who your higher power is, for me, it's Jesus Christ, it's God. And, and so when I'm praying, it is, it's not just for his permissive will, but it's for his perfect will. Because there are a lot of things that I can do, but I want to make sure that I'm, I'm lined up with, with his perfect will, because I know that even if the result isn't thus and so, that the result is exactly what he intends for it to be. And that, that is a big difference. And there's a level of faith that comes with that too. You know, when I, when I missed the team in 1984 by two one hundredth of a second, you would never have me believe that I wasn't in the place doing the things that I was supposed to do at that moment as dictated by him. And it wasn't until years later that I understood that was actually a blessing. I would have been such a different person if I had made that team at that time. I needed to work. I needed to have that time under my belt. I needed to know more about the process so that I could have an appreciation for it. So there are no accidents. Mm. Prayer, meditation, writing. Mm. That, oh, so big. <laughs> Those are so big. <laughs> um, and one of the things that I love about writing is also that we forget that we have so many thoughts in our mind. Um, I think, you know, daily we have 70,000 thoughts in our mind. And no wonder you're overwhelmed. That's all. You're talking to yourself. And oh, no wonder you don't remember things because there's so many thoughts in your brain. And writing just like takes all of this noise out of it and focuses really. And I love that you also differentiate between meditation and prayer. I think meditation is very introspective. It's about getting to know yourself and prayer is more with the connection to God and understanding what does you know, God expect of me. Um, so I love that you make that distinction. I wanted to talk a bit more about um, that moment when you turned 50 and when you said, okay, this is, and we talked about this before, this is like a new time of my life. Um, you built also a platform, Not Your Mama's 50. And um, I wanted to know a bit more about that intentionality behind, you know, being intentional in how you grow and how that new stage of your life just expands your horizon to so many different things where sometimes you know, people only talk about things until 40, you know. Forbes 30 under 30, Forbes 40 under 40. And then it feels like the narrative is like 50 is a time where like you don't matter anymore. Like that's like nobody talks about that life, you know, that that rest of the 50, inshallah, hopefully years <laughs> that you have ahead of you. They're like, oh yeah, you know, my life is over. So I wanted to talk a bit more about when you came into that space for you, where where did where did you find yourself? And Wow, that, you know, that's, it's been a journey. <laughs> I, I think leading into 50, probably three or four years, I realized, you know, in our friend group, we have the different relationships and stuff. And I'm, I'm the person that people call to like, either run strategy by or try and figure out something because I'm, I'm a pretty good strategizer. <laughs> um, so I, I realized I was in a similar conversation time and time again, over and over with the women that I know really powerful women, um, but they were going, we were going through changes in our lives that we didn't sign up for. We're the first generation of women who have literally had it all. <laughs> We've had access to everything, sport, career, education, family. 
I just saw a thing from uh, a quote from the, the new Sex in the City movie, um, just like that, or yeah, just like that, I think it is. And, and the woman says, can we have it all? And the character says, we can, but you're gonna be tired. <laughs> That is the truth. You actually can have it all. But, and I know when I say but, I negate everything I said before it. But when you get into the middle part of your life, there are going to be some changes that happen that you did not sign up for. Things that you could not have conceived of. Things that you're like, I did all the right things. Why is this happening to me? Divorce or leaving a relationship. Divorce, either something that you're seeking or something that you're not seeking. All of these things can happen. Your children grow up and leave for college. How dare they leave you? <laughs> you're having a change in your career or you're aged out. <laughs> Ageism is, you know, it's a nasty little beast. All this experience and all of a sudden you're not relevant. And so we were having this conversation. And so for my 50th birthday, what I did was I brought 23 of my best girlfriends to Las Vegas. And we did what we called party for a purpose. <laughs> and we launched Not Your Mama's 50. And the initiative, originally the tagline was not better, not worse, just different. And so the initiative is to support one another in our 2.0. So what I found was somebody could talk to me and I would have 50 different answers for whatever it was they were going through and vice versa. I could talk to somebody else and they'd say, oh, do this, that, and the other, call me in the morning. <laughs> and, and it's sometimes when you're not in the middle of it, when you're not the star of whatever drama is going on, you can get wise counsel from somebody else who's been through it or who is in your same age category, who can give you that objective view. And so this is what the initiative was about. We have a, a Facebook group page, it's a private page, but you know, if you, if you ask, we'll bring you in. <laughs> about 600 women. And it's a very active page, you know, really encouraging one another and, you know, bringing up topics, knocking them around and just being just being girls, you know, just being girls. And so the, the initiative has, has transformed into a question. And the question is, we are answering the questions that our mothers never had to ask. There are things that my mom, who is an incredible woman, she just things that I deal with that she never had to deal with. I met my husband on match. <laughs> my mom didn't have to deal with that. <laughs> So, you know, it's, it's just, it's just a different, it's a different world. But what I want women to know more than anything is that your issues matter, your solutions matter. You have them inside of you and you have them for other women. And more than anything, you're not alone. You are not alone. Because a lot of times we do feel alone because, because we're much as given, much as required and much as expected, we've been given all these opportunities. And so we're being expected to have all the answers. How do you not know, Leslie? Shit, I don't know. <laughs> How do you not know? And so this is, this is so women know that we are not alone. I have you, you have me, and together we're going to figure this out. Mm, that's a big one. Mini break, please don't forget to subscribe. Hit the subscribe button to get the newest and freshest content. I want to talk more about ageism. Um, and specifically gendered ageism. I do think that there's a double standard out there of valuing how men age and how they become more wise and sexy and, you know, like sophisticated um, and how women age and how that is really looked at very differently. And um, we talked a bit about your gray hair journey, but I wanted to give you that space as well because you look gorgeous. Um, really, you are such a role model for me. And just seeing you bloom into this new version of yourself is just, it's just so inspiring. So I want to talk more about your personal experience with it, if you, if you want to share. And then also, um, and I think this is something that we don't see a lot of companies do or spaces do. Where do you see opportunities in the media, in companies and brands to create more opportunities for um for talking about you know growing and aging and taking out that stigma well thank you for uh, for broaching that Cena. 
you know, my, my silver journey <laughs> has been, it's been coming for a while, um, for about the last maybe year or so, even a little bit more. Um, I haven't dyed my hair, so I've been doing very temporary solutions and everything. I wanted to be able to grow it enough that I could then debut it in all of its silver glory. <laughs> so the funny thing is, um, one of my dear friends from high school used to call me the baby faced assassin <laughs> because I had this you know, sweet little face and I would get out there with surgical precision, like knocking them down on the track. And, uh, and so she said the other day, she said, you know, you changed from the baby face assassin to the silver assassin. I said, you know what? I'm here for that. New brand. <laughs> I'm here for that. Yes. Slaying gender ageism in all of its wretched forms. I am here for that. Because the thing about it is, if you're lucky, if you're blessed, you get to this point. A lot of people didn't. So let's start there. If you're blessed, you get to this point. And, and when you get to this point, there is a tremendous amount of experience, but not just experience. You have this like kick-ass confidence that you're like, you know what, bring it. <laughs> and not to say that you have all of the answers, but you have this life of testimony, of testimony of things that you have been to and through. And that helps you to create your what's next. And so it's, I think it's so important. I love that Forbes did a 50 over 50 this year of women who are over 50. Our beautiful vice president <laughs> was on the cover. Shonda Rhimes is on the cover. And I just think it's, it's an incredible thing because we are here. We will not be ignored. <laughs> was it Glenn Close in um, uh, Fatal Attraction? I will not be ignored. <laughs> and it's it's not even a, a demand for attention. It is a command for attention, okay? You command the room. When you walk in with a level of confidence, knowing who you are, why you're there, and the value that you bring, it transforms the energy of everyone with whom you meet. That's what I want women to take from, from this conversation, is that what I'm doing is no different than what you, you will do and what you can do. And, and for the young women who are coming up, I'd love for it to be there to be a time where a woman growing her hair out is just like past the salt. It's just the normal occurrence. It's nothing big. It's nothing that needs to be celebrated. Oh, wow, she had a coming out party. Girl, it's just an everyday thing, okay? It is an everyday thing. I, you know, I don't look to the world to define my sexuality or, you know, whether or not I'm sexy or anything like that. That comes from me. That's how I carry myself, irrespective of if my hair is brown or silver or purple. It is on me. And, and that's the thing I want for us to understand. And I think when brands get to the point where they... They understand that not only are women in our age category beautiful and vivacious and we bring a lot of experience, we got some pretty big purses too, okay? <laughs> we are the ones making the decision, holding the purse strings in most households. And many of us are heads of those households. So it would behoove them. We started this, this conversation around diversity. How, why is diversity important? It's important to a business's bottom line. You want me to purchase your products, then I better see somebody that looks like me, both gender, both age, both ethnicity, ethnicity that looks like me, hawking your products. Because if there's no one that looks like me, you're not going to get my ad dollars and you're certainly not going to get me buying your product. Exactly. And that's something that I, I just... All the comments are also like I I feel this is just, this is really really important to point out as well something that I've heard which is the mindset shift of this is one of the diversity dimensions right this is one of the isms that everyone is going to experience if we are blessed enough to live right and the dirty little secret that nobody talks about <laughs> no one talks about it it's like let's just forget it and I think another point is also with fifty there's so much spending power. How do we not understand that there's so much spending power that brands actually leave well, behind? 
<laughs> right? Like in yeah. the in the, in your twenties, you're struggling. In your thirties, you're making good money. In your forties, you're spending it on on a family, right? In your fifties, family's out of the house. What are you gonna do with all the money? This is- <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. I mean, you know, the the thing about it too, Cena, is when we when we look at the at the spending power of women in general and then you start to bifurcate it for different demographics there is so much money to be had there and and the beauty industry i think is it's the industry that is um both encouraging us and also causing many of the issues Okay, you have brands like Rihanna's um, Fenty. She brought in a a silver haired model, a black woman, and she is just gorgeous. And I think it was so smart of her to do that because, first of all, I'm looking for black products and I'm looking for black owned products as well. But now that you have someone who looks like me and has my same age experience, oh, you're really going to get my money. You're really going to get my money. I can't tell you how many times I walked into a, a department store and, you know, into the makeup department and I see things. I'm like, I didn't even know I needed that. <laughs> you know, we don't need all of those things. That it is an industry that is built on our insecurities. Well, we're shedding that. We are shedding that. And one of the best ways we can do it is through our main. <laughs> I love this. And we have... Um... We also have a comment here. My hair started turning gray at 16 and every time I let it grow, I get judged. And one of the one of the articles you sent me was also Jer- Sarah Jessica Parker uh, being judged, growing out her hair, sitting next to her male friend who has gray hair. What's the logic? That's crazy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You know, for for the the person, the woman that uh, said her hair started going gray at 16, I I identify 100%. I think mine started maybe early 30s, but that still is twice your age. But here's the piece. Here's the piece. This is about you. It's about your journey. And people are going to judge you no matter what they're going to, people are going to find something to pick at. And if we make the decision, if your choice is to continue coloring your hair until you're 80, that is completely your choice. Understanding that they're going to find something else to judge. So if you can find your comfort, irrespective of what anyone else says, if you can find your comfort, then that call's coming in. <laughs> Sorry about that. It calls coming in. Um, if you can find your place of comfort, the outside doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. And that's, I, I recognize that's a, that's a big ask in our society. And only you can answer that question in that meditative time, in that writing time, and in that prayer time. Yeah. Wow. And so many, so many beautiful things that you are sharing. And I think one of the major um, things that you just said was that people will always find something to criticize you. And specifically, specifically for women, specifically for women of color, there's always storm drama coming from all sides. <laughs> <laughs> so the one person that has to be on your side is yourself is you because there's not you know there's there's so many them there are so many things that are going to follow you around and you have to face wherever you go so that just self-appreciation is so so big and I'm so glad you came here and you spoke with us and I want to open the stage for people who have questions. So please, please drop your questions in the comments um, and in the comment box or um, you know, request to go live with us. We have Ash here who's, who's uh, here in the comments. She's also a diversity um, expert. So also happy to have her on if she has any questions. Um, and I wanted to come to the last uh, bit of the podcast, which I always ask. Um, which is, do you have a question for the audience that they can answer in the comments below? Anything that we talked about that will really spark some self-reflection and uh, we can interact with them a bit. 
Okay. I actually have two things, Sina. Okay. And there are two phrases that are, are near and dear to my heart. One of them I said earlier, and that one, this one is trademarked. When women rise, we rarely rise alone. And so my question to the audience is, what woman helped you to rise? And, and you might even want to reach out to her and let her know. And who are you helping to rise? Who are you actively helping to take that next step that would elevate a woman's life, her career, her standing, the whole nine yards? My second question would be, um, also out of a phrase, but it's not mine. <laughs> how we do anything is how we do everything. So my question is, how are you doing your life? Are you doing it in a way that serves the things that you say you want to achieve, become, or have? That is so beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing. Cass, please comment down below and share your diversity with us. And we have a question in the chat. How have your friends reacted to your beautiful hair? <laughs> um, they have been so encouraging. I mean, just blowing me up on social, on my phone. It's It's been really, really cool. And it's been so much fun too, <laughs> with my family. My, my husband was like, I feel like I got a girlfriend. <laughs> My, my son said, mom, I'm getting that storm vibe. <laughs> and my daughter said, mom, only you could take growing old and make it a brand statement. <laughs> I said, you know what? You got that right. <laughs> that is what so I, I, really <laughs> I love that. I love that. It's so beautiful to also see your surrounding reflect exactly what you're saying, which is, you know, you, you, as women, we never rise alone. Like there's always going to be, if I come up, I will bring someone else up and it's so beautiful. So thank you so much, Leslie, for coming on uh, and joining us with your beautiful energy. Um, and um, yeah, any last words that you have for the audience, please share. Um, I, you know, I just am very grateful for this time to connect with you, Sina. The first time we met, I just, I just thought you were such a bright light. And, and now having followed you for the last couple of months, I see that my suspicions were really, really true. So I, I just, I think you are just an incredible woman bringing a very necessary message and, and stay wonderful and keep doing what you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Blessed to have you here and share this space with you and uh, you joining us for this time. Um, thank you so much. Thank you for everyone else who also came on. You have a good day. Everyone else, a good morning, day, evening, wherever you are. Salam. Right. If you love this video, please make sure that you like and subscribe and share this with someone who needs to hear this. And I'll see you next time. Assalamu alaikum.